Hello and welcome to this session of Facebook Live uh, at Raisina 2020. I have with me uh, Mr. Richard M. Rasso, who is Senior Advisor and Wadwani Chair in the in US India Policy Studies Center for Strategic and International Studies US and uh, my colleague at ORF uh, Bharat Gopalaswamy he is a senior fellow uh, we are going to look at Modi 2.0 with the reforms that uh, this government has undertaken till now and the way forward uh, mr rosso you have been uh, sort of monitoring reforms by Modi government beginning his first term. So if we can do a quick uh, recap of what has been done till now and how do you see him moving now that he is into, well settled into his second term. Yeah, well thank you and thank you for having me on. Uh, Modi during the first term uh, came in and we'd established a scorecard of about 30 major reforms that we thought would be important to get the economy trucking, to get uh, business private investment going. Uh, during the entire first term, we actually saw the Modi government carry out nine of the 30 reforms that we were monitoring, which we think is a pretty good track record for any economy to do within a five-year period, though it was a little heavy up front. Six of those nine reforms took place during the first year. Um, you saw a number of big ones, I mean, goods and services tax, bankruptcy, uh, some of the steps they took to combat tax terrorism were quite good. Uh, coming into the second term, they haven't really articulated as much of a, of a big picture strategy. Some of the big ones like labor and land appear to be kind of stuck in, in the political realm. You did see a major tax cut right now, but otherwise, I, I think the business community is kind of waiting for what are some of the other big things that they plan on doing. One of my favorites that was not part of our scorecard, though, was getting states to compete more effectively for investment. And we'll, I do hope they come back we'll to that. Come, we'll yep. come back to that. Bharat, how do, you, how do you see things shaping up at the moment? Do you see any immediate reforms happening, or will Mr. Modi uh, try to ride out the storm over the state of the economy and then bring in reforms? I think um, I agree with my colleague in the first term, this was a very re reform-driven agenda. I think what has happened in the second term, as far as the perception goes, is we sense that the administration has got, gotten distracted with more of the political issues than the reform issues. And then the economic issues are obviously there. Um, so you've seen um, a lot of, a, a little bit of liquidity crisis, you've seen a credit crunch, and you've seen some of these, um, um, banking sectors, the woos in the banking sectors. So, but all that's been dominated in the mid, uh, um, in terms of the political issues that, that, they're, um, that they're distracted with. I think to get that story back, to get on the reforms agenda back, like um, the government has to articulate a vision, the government has to articulate what the idea is and the strategy behind that vision, and how do you get that strategy and the execution right? I think at least, on the public relations side of it, this must be done um, so that you know, people start focusing on those issues first. Mr. Rosso, uh, uh, there is always this view that after all in a democracy, every government uh, has to be mindful of po the, the political part of its uh, policies. So right now the government should be driven only by the concern of nursing the economy back to health and reforms can wait. Would you buy into that view? I think there's room to do some reforms that won't take as much political will. You know, for instance, look at FDI caps. I mean, 21 years ago, when I first started working on U.S. commercial relations with India, talking about any FDI cap was politically hot potato. And now the government's opening up defense and retail and insurance, and the blowback against doing that has been relatively minor. So there's, there's about 20 other sectors that still have FDI restrictions. Uh, without the, you know, major blowback and opening up most of those, and the potential quick uh, injection of new, uh, new monies by foreign investors, you know, things like that are relatively easy. Um, there's some smaller steps as well that uh, I think the government can take on fixing GST, some of the problems that we know are broke, uh, bankruptcy, getting small businesses so they can get access to capital a bit easier. They're not getting paid by a lot of their uh, larger uh, clients, and so can you collateralize uh, debts that are owed to small businesses? There's a lot of small steps that will not generate the kind of political heat and attention. So I think you can do some reforms, even the big ones like land and labor are a little tricky right now. There's some other smart reforms I think the government can do, even while it tries to you know, uh, get the economy uh, trucking by uh, injecting its own capital in, into the economy. Bharat, everybody talks about the credit crunch, but nobody, I mean, people used to talk about cleaning up the banking sector, 
but suddenly people have stopped talking about it. But cleaning up the banking sector would also mean uh, having a very tight regime in place that loans don't go bad because after all the blowback is faced by the government. Yeah, I mean, I think that you run the risk of, look, there are also that um, currently I think, you know, there are a lot of defaulters and a lot of banks are underwater because of all these bad lending, so to speak. But you also run the risk of excessive regulation and excessive scrutiny and you, you want to protect the regulator at the, at the same time as well as somebody who is also a good, somebody who has good credit can get loans as easy um, so that he doesn't have to pay the price for somebody who have willfully defaulted the banks. So I think there is a balance somewhere in that balance. And the reason I'm talking about this and I'm particularly passionate about this because right now we are, I represent part of this in the private sector and we are, we're dealing with the Indian bankruptcy court and we are dealing through the NCLP process. And the process is so cumbersome and the process is at some levels opaque and it's still evolving. So the uncertainty as a foreign company trying to buy an Indian company or do a joint venture is still not the easiest process out here. Mr. Rosso, you, you did make a mention that uh, in a country which has 28 provinces and every government has a set of uh, uh, it has its own list, uh, including on economy, on industry, on agriculture. Yet, it would seem that only the federal government is made to carry the buck. I mean, you know, the, the buck stops with the federal government and the state governments get away with impunity. I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, sitting in Washington, um, there's so little attention the United States pays. But even when I'm in Delhi, um, and you start talking about real business environment, you know, 80% or so of the licenses that you need to operate are state licenses. Land clearance is done at the state level. Labor regulations, this intractable issue from Delhi, you've got uh, almost a half a dozen states now that have actually amended the Industrial Disputes Act. It can happen at that level. These reforms that we think Delhi hasn't been able to do, that the central government hasn't been able to do. So 28 states, you've got some of them that are going to grow at double digits this year, and a lot of them they are going to be well below that. And a lot of that is driven by the decisions that the state government itself takes. You know, with the change in government uh, recently in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh in particular, where you see tearing up of contracts for the power sector, for the development of the new capital city, things like that, you know, the, the kind of uh, fear that puts in investors. How do you allocate more capital? And that's the seventh largest economy in India. But that seems to be a pattern over here. Every time a state government changes, the first thing you do is you call for the files of the previous government and you keep on canceling agreements, uh, MOUs, uh, whatever you have signed, whatever was signed by the previous government, you just want to make a political point. Well, and, and there's no broad brush on that, because I've seen that in earlier times in Maharashtra, I've seen that in Tamil Nadu several times, that constant swing between DMK and AIDMK, um, Andhra most recently, but there's plenty of others where you do see relative stability even when transitioning between state governments. So, you know, it's a bit of a mix, but, but to your point, which I think is the perfect point, we all need to be paying more attention and holding chief ministers more accountable for not taking these kind of steps, because they can get away with taking a lot of these decisions relatively scot-free, and that's got a huge impact on the economy. Bharat, you want to weigh in on this? Well, I mean, I think, uh, which you brought out in the sense, you know, sometimes the politicization of these issues adds to the overall toxicity of the growth in itself. And India is such a huge basket in terms of number of political parties at, at the regional level. So you don't want the business, you know, the private sector and the business, the businesses to be hampered by this kind of a growth. I mean, so just, you know, stashing away a file because it was signed by the previous administration or putting some of these, you know, look, you're a, you're a country which has an aim of, uh, we're a country which has an aim of around $5 trillion growth. And if you want to do these kinds of things, I think you must, you know, the prime minister first said, uh, the government has no business to be in business. So at some levels, politics should not be uh, politics should not interfere with these kinds of business. And these are like the land and labor reforms are at are you know land labor reforms and infrastructure are three main um, three main areas where this country rapidly needs uh, adjustments and reforms. And I think if you get the politics get in the way of it, I I, I don't think it's a good idea. On. Labor, this government is now thinking of bringing in, of, of, of streamlining the law. And you know, you will have three different laws merged into one code. 
and state governments do not have to amend the act any further, but they can just uh, issue a notification through an executive order you can implement change. So would you consider that to be a substantial reform on labor? Yeah, uh, any time that you can take a decision on changing Industrial Disputes Act or the Triggers in the Factories Act and take it out of law and hand it as regulation, uh, definitely preferable over having to go back to Parliament. I mean, you're talking about with Industrial Disputes Act, the most far-reaching states shifted the trigger from 100 employees to 300 employees. That is not a large uh, a corporation either. You know, Chinese companies that are competing with India and this kind of scale they can do. So 300, it's nice but it's not even nearly at the scope that they need to do to try to really attract the businesses that went to places like China before. So uh, taking that out of law is a, is a great step, and I hope that uh, Parliament uh, moves on that quickly. Bharat, on land, states can have their own laws and move ahead. So why isn't that happening? Well, I mean, I'm not, any, I'm not an expert on why isn't that particularly happening. But I'll tell you this. I mean, I think, again, it comes down to the politicization of these issues, as far as I can tell. And I, you know, if there is no mechanics to, one is the politicization of these issues. And then, then the other issue that I come is enforcement. If this is not happening, why isn't that not happening? And what are the steps that one can make to um, get that happening? So, you know, somebody has to ask these questions and somebody has to be a, uh, an enforcer about why something is not happening rather than why something has gone wrong. But the problem is that a whole lot of them are in what is called the states list. The center can't and legislate on that. So, you know, there is one state and only one state that has amended the Land Acquisition Act that the UPA government passed, Andhra. This was one of the last things that the Naidu government had done. But to answer your question on why other states haven't, uh, I've sat with a number of states and asked that very same question. And two words come out of their mouth, Buddhadeb Bhattacharji. <laughs> I mean, they, they saw what happened un when the regime was a little bit lighter and, you know, Trinamil Congress was you know, the, the opposition party, but a small opposition party. And that one single issue on land clearance was the most significant to fling them over the top and bring them to power. And so any state government in India that is worried about party number two and three and four, they know that issue is going to be taken up. So it's very politically divisive. But that would be true for the central government too. I mean, they would also be worried about political blowbacks. Well, it's like, you know, when you're in the opposition, you know, you, 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 you reap the seeds that you sow when you were, when you're in the ruling, you reap the seeds that you sow when you were in the opposition. That's what's happening in some of these things. Okay. Yeah. Each one of you, 30 seconds. What would you like to see happen in the course of this one year? I mean, I think, you know, the, as I said, the biggest ones are the labor and the land reform, right? I mean, the government has not been shy about taking some of these landmark decisions, so to speak, on the political status quo that's haunted the country for decades. So when you can do that, when there is a political will, there is also a way. Mr. Rosa? I think they've got to recommit to holding states' feet to the fire. Uh, when Modi came in, they started this uh, business reform action plan, a ranking states' business environment. They haven't done a ranking and released it in three years now. State governments are able to take steps they want to with very little oversight and review. And states don't frankly know best practices. The last round they did, most states were at 90% or higher. I mean, what threshold are you setting if Indian states are at 90% of a perfect business environment? So I think uh, recommitting to holding states' feet to the fire, that's the one thing I'd like to see. Thank you very much for joining us. Keep watching Facebook Live from Raisina Dialogue 2020. There will be other interesting discussions happening. The, the, the conversation will continue. And thank you for being over here with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you.